Good afternoon. I see that our screens are starting to light up and people are finishing with their sign in to join us this afternoon. I'll just give you a few more seconds to complete that sign in. Okay, here we go. Thank you, Dorothy and Christine in the background there. Good afternoon. I'm Trixie Ann Goldberg, a Director of Development for Academic Medicine at the Banner Health Foundation. Having had a chance to visit with so many of you who are part of this conversation today, I truly know and appreciate what an extraordinary gathering this is today, and I welcome each and every one of you. I'm very pleased to introduce our host and moderator for At the Heart of Hope, Dr. Jeremy Goodman. As Chief Medical Officer for Banner University Medical Center, Phoenix, Dr. Goodman has been instrumental in advancing excellence in patient care, innovation, access, and safety at Banner's flagship academic medical center. Dr. Goodman's leadership on behalf of Banner University medical staff has been key to advancing the institution's national rankings and regional leadership. Dr. Goodman's career experiences as a transplant surgeon and medical educator fuel his vision for advancing healthcare delivery and health outcomes. Dr. Goodman holds degrees from Keck School of Medicine at University of South California, Yale, and an MBA from Urban, from Urban University. Uh, good afternoon, Dr. Goodman. And Robert, sorry. Good. Thank you so much for that gracious introduction. I am so excited to welcome you all here to our first Banner University Medical Center Phoenix at Home Together webinar featuring our truly miraculous Advanced Heart Failure Center. And I'm honored to serve as your moderator for today's discussion. Uh, as Trixie Ann mentioned, uh, my name is Jeremy Goodman, and I have the privilege of serving as the Chief Medical Officer at Banner University Medical Center Phoenix. Today, you are in for a treat because we are gonna be hearing firsthand from two internationally known leaders, Dr. Francisco Arabia and Dr. Radha Gopalan on the milestones that have been achieved in the Advanced Heart Failure Center, and how Banner University Medical Center Phoenix's leadership role in mechanical circulatory support and now heart transplantation is saving lives. And here's what I think you'll find most inspiring. Their team's continued pursuit of life-saving technologies and treatments will further improve the lives of those with advanced heart failure. A few housekeeping items before we get started. Today's session is being recorded and our audience has been muted. There'll be time for questions at the end of the session, so please feel free to submit questions at any time during our presentation using the chat icon at the bottom of your screen. I'll share your questions on your behalf with the speakers once their presentations have concluded. Before I introduce our first speaker, I would like to share a little bit of the background on Banner University Medical Center and our Heart Institute. As we begin on the next slide, I'm so proud of our hospital and happy to share some information about what makes us so special. Banner University Medical Center in Phoenix is Arizona's largest hospital with over 750 licensed beds. We have five intensive care units Although I'll also share that in the midst of this pandemic, that has been expanded to seven intensive care units. and We've had the privilege of taking care of more critically ill patients during this pandemic than any other hospital in the state. We have 63 emergency department rooms. We have our own inpatient behavioral health unit. And we're happy to welcome every year almost 6,000 newborns to Arizona. Our campus is the size of a small city. And on any given day, you'll find over 4,000 employees, over 2,000 medical staff members, 300 residents and fellows populating our campus along with countless other learners, visitors, and others visiting our campus. And what I think is most important in the context of our conversation today, and absolutely with the help of our foundation partners and others, we're happy to provide every year over $45 million in charity care to the people of Phoenix and the citizens of Arizona. On the next slide, I wanna talk a little bit about the unique partnership that we have with the University of Arizona. It was just five short years ago that Banner Health and the University of Arizona entered into a really historic 30-year affiliation agreement. 
that led to the creation of the Banner University Medicine Division in Phoenix and Tucson. Banner has played no small part in this, investing over $1.2 billion in the partnership, and culminating in the beautiful new building that I'm sitting in today. In addition, Banner University Medical Center Phoenix was designated the primary clinical site for the College of Medicine, and this partnership is helping us to achieve our tripartite mission of excellence in research, teaching, and clinical service. Next, I wanna tell you a little bit about what I think is really our flagship program, the Heart Institute at Banner University Medicine Division in Phoenix. Our cardiac program is comprehensive and includes just about anything any of our patients could possibly need in the realm of heart disease, including preventive cardiac care and consultation, cardiac imaging, interventional cardiology, and the region's largest advanced structural heart program, an electrophysiology program, and then what is the focus of our webinar today, our Advanced Heart Failure Center. We also have a robust cardiac rehabilitation program, and all of this hinges on the outstanding partnership between our employed physicians and a robust roster of independent community-based cardiologists that choose our medical center as the best place to care for their patients. Next, I wanna share a little bit about the investments that our campus and Banner's leadership is making in the future of cardiac care. Soon we'll be home to one of the most advanced robotic electrophysiology labs in the world. Today, you're gonna to hear about the wonders of heart transplantation and the incredible accomplishments of our advanced heart failure program in the areas of mechanical circulatory sport, support, ECMO, which we'll hear a little bit more about, a tremendous amount of research, and what I really have to thank the foundation for, which is the support in our faculty's growth and professional development. We're really just at the beginning of the wonders that this Heart Institute can do. And it's with the support of the foundation that we're able to invest in our faculty and build these programs into not just a regional, but a national leader in cardiac care. I'd like to introduce you now to our program at the Heart of Hope. We're fortunate to have two internationally regarded and highly sought after physicians and surgeons and medical educators with us today. Dr. Francisco Arabia is the surgical director of our program. And Dr. Rado Gopalan is our medical director. Dr. Gopalan is soon going to share with us the miraculous story of an incredible life saved and the restoration of a true hero's health. But before I let him tug on your heartstrings, Dr. Arabia is going to outline the complexity and wonder of just what a comprehensive advanced heart failure and transplant program looks like. And so with that, I'm gonna take a stab here at introducing Dr. Arabia, and I'm sure that this brief biography really does not do him justice. Dr. Arabia joined the medical center here in 2018 and serves as the physician executive of our, our advanced heart failure and mechanical circulatory support program with responsibilities throughout the entire Banner Health System. Dr. Arabia is also a professor of surgery at the University of Arizona College of Medicine. He received his bachelor's degree in biomedical engineering from Tulane University, a medical degree from the University of Pennsylvania. He also has a business degree from the University of Arizona where he spent 15 years, including a time as professor of surgery. He served as the co-director of the artificial heart program and the surgical director of the lung transplant program and initiated their ECMO program. Following that, he moved to the Mayo Clinic in Scottsdale where he once again established a heart transplant program as well as a mechanical circulatory support service. He served as professor and chair there of their section of cardiovascular and thoracic surgery. Following this, he served as the director for device management and advanced heart disease at Cedar sinai Heart Institute in Los Angeles between 2012 and 2018. Before, after what I understand was years of relentless begging, we were finally able to attract him back here to Phoenix. He has over 100 publications in the field of mechanical circulatory support, and over 85 appearances in media regarding this technology. Every year, he has numerous speaking engagements at both national and international venues. He serves as a consultant and an instructor to various medical centers and in industry regarding the use of mechanical circulatory support, left ventricular assist devices, and total artificial hearts. He serves as a reviewer for multiple national and international journals regarding this technology. And I think most importantly, 
He is a fine friend, an excellent doctor, and a compassionate human being. So Dr. Arabia, let me turn the program over to you. We're excited to learn a little bit more about the mechanics of our program from you. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Goodman, for that incredible short introduction. So I highly appreciate it. Uh, hopefully it will help kind of set the, the tone of where we're trying to do and, and show you. I just want to thank also uh, Banner Health uh, and the staff that have put this together. And of course, my good uh, partner in all these, uh, Dr. Gopalan, who you will hear about it in a few minutes. So if I go to the next slide, we have created uh, an advanced heart failure program here at Banner University. And the main recipient of all these are our patients, heart patients who develop a condition that shortens their life if we don't do anything. And our main goal is to make these patients better, give them life, and give them a better opportunity in life to continue to enjoy it. The program, we, we put it together to deliver a very comprehensive, compassionate, safe care, and primarily advanced technologies as we move into the future with these newer therapies that are we describing. We not only work with the patient, but we educate the families of the patient with all these new technologies, including transplantation and other devices. And of course, we want to grow this to a national level and international, as, as you'll see in a few minutes. Our mission in the next slide, as you can see, is to make healthcare easier. So life can be better, meaning a better quality of life. Our strategy to do this is to help our, our patients to do this and be able to grow and uh, our reach and be able to offer this to more patients, not only in the Phoenix area, but at a regional, national, and international arena. We want to inspire the people that we work with. That means the team that we have put together and that Dr. Kopala has been a significant uh, architect of it, is we want to make sure they are inspired and very engaging and we and able to communicate the message to make life better. Of course, we always look for new ways of doing this. So in the next slide, I'll show you how this Advanced Heart Failure Center that worked within Banner UMC Phoenix and in the Heart Institute is put together. As you can see, there are four main parts. There is mechanical circulatory support, which includes ventricular assist device and total artificial heart. And if you have never seen one or know what that is, I'll be showing you what that means. The next subgroup or sub program is in-house ECMO. ECMO, for many of you that you have heard in the last few months, has become very active, uh, part of our daily language, especially in the area of taking care of COVID patients. So it helps patients with heart failure, and I'll show you how. For patients who are far away from our institution, we have created the mobile intensive care unit that we call MOVI, uh, and that is a way of projecting, outreaching our program to other parts of the state. And of course, heart transplantation, which is always the lead program, is, is the program that attracts everything that we do because not only of the complexity, the incredible level of regulation at federal and state levels, but the fact that we are taking a heart from someone and put it in, 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 a, in a live patient. So all those four sub programs come together and we make sure that there is quality, that we can develop the program, the medical and surgical teams participate in all four of them. There is an operational structure to make sure that processes in each of those subgroups are working well. We have to be uh, very cautious uh, and, and very cognizant of the regulatory from both the federal government and the state. We have to make sure that these programs are well run so they are financially sustainable and again, maintain quality. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take all those four parts for sub programs and show you each one, how each one is and what interact. And maybe it's more information that you want. So the mechanical circulatory support is, is the first sub program. And this one has actually 
was initially created here about 10 years ago at BUMCP, and it was using left ventricular assist device. Left ventricular assist devices are pumps that we can put in a patient who has heart failure in order to help for the flow of blood. And the way we connect these left ventricular assist devices is pretty consistent. On the left of the, of the screen, you see one that is called the hardware. It connects to the apex of the heart to the bottom where you feel your pulse in your, in your chest. And from there, it takes blood from the heart and it pumps into one of the main blood vessels in the heart. And that is to promote flow or provide the flow that the heart cannot provide. And in the video in the center, you can see how it attaches, how it works inside. And, and it pretty much works like the uh, water pump in, in your car. It's very, very simple. And that provides continuous flow. And continuous flow is just like when you open your garden hose at home, you have continuous stream. So these devices, especially the one on the left, provide flow like that. It's straight, so the patient does not have a pulse and that creates some new consideration in their care. On the right side, you see the RMA3. It's a newer generation device. It is very similar to the one on the left, but this one accelerates and decelerates the spinner inside to provide a small pulse. So it is the beginning of the technology going towards providing more physiologic flow in these left ventricular assist devices. In these devices, we leave the heart in place and we just add this new pump. The drive line that you see is a cable that exits the patient that goes to a controller, a computer, and, and the power supply. In the next slide, we go uh, one step further. And this is the patient, this total artificial heart is for the patients whose heart is completely failing. M most of the patients that get this device usually act have only a few hours or a few days of life left. As you can see, this is the only device that is approved in the United States, in Europe, in, and in Canada. There is a device on the left side. It has two pumps, actually. It's driven by compressed air. And when we go in, we actually, in the picture in the middle, you can see, we take the human heart out and we put this heart in. The patient continues to have pulsatile flow but there is no electrical activity. So there is no EKG, no need to do an EKG when they come back to the hospital. On the right side, that is actually a total artificial heart working inside a patient. You can see the four valves that are opening and closed and those two white uh, clouds are actually air going inside the device, moving diaphragms that actually move the blood. The blood and the air do not interact. In the next slide, we go to another generation of total artificial heart. This is the second generation, this CARMAT total artificial heart. It was actually designed and it's built in France. There only been about 16 of them implanted in the world. And it would, they would, it would start a trial in the United States by the end of this year. We happen to be, Banner was chosen as one of the seven hospitals in the country to participate in this trial. The other six hospitals are major centers that have been involved in heart failure, both in the East Coast and the West Coast. This device is different in that the lining inside is actually a biological tissue. It's all, the blood only touches uh, tissue, uh, uh, the surfaces that are biological. It has two little pumps that you can see on the right side that actually move a fluid inside and that fluid then moves a diaphragm and then the blood. The next slide goes to the next generation total artificial heart. It's called the Biverpool. This one is still in, in animal trial and it's all made out of titanium. There are two parts to it, as you can see in the, on the, in the video on the right side. Inside, there is only one moving part. There are no valves. It is one moving part that you can see there on the lower screen, that moving part is floating inside. It's not touching any parts of the device. There are no bearings. The, that impeller, that rotor has two, two faces, one to the left and one to the right. And it is propelled by electromagnetic energy. 
So by changing the speed of the rotation, you can accelerate and decelerate that impeller and in that way create a pulse. And because it's all computer driven, you can create, you can program what kind of pulse you want. This one we hope will be in clinical trials in the United States and the world probably within three years. And I can tell you that Banner will be an active participant in this trial as we are already involved in some of the animal uh, studies. So moving on, another sub-program of, of the advanced heart failure is the in-house ECMO. And again, ECMO is very familiar because everyone has heard it in COVID patients. This device actually replaces the lungs or the heart and lung. And you can see it there in the center, in the left picture, there are blood pipes that come to the, connect to the patient. And in this way, you can actually take the blood out from the patient, oxygenate it, and pump it back to the patient. On the right side is just more, a more complex picture of what it looks like. The ECMO program here at Banner UNCB was established in, 19, uh, in, in 2010, and we have been able to expand it. And it's used use for patients who need the support in, within a few hours or a few minutes. Uh, so there is no time to take them to surgery to do something. Else. In the next slide, now we take ECMO and we take it now to another subprogram, the mobile intensive care unit. We take the, if there are patients in other hospitals that are not banned, that do not have these technology available, what we do is we send a SWAT team out and the SWAT team goes in with all kinds of equipment and they can stabilize the patient at the other institution, connect them to ECMO, for example, stabilize them in their ACU and then move them to Banner UMC Phoenix. In this way, what we do here can be exported outreach to other places within the state. So MOB is very important for us. The next slide is probably the, the flagship program for the advanced heart failure program. That is heart transplantation. And this has been a, a very uh, challenging program to put together, but amazingly, there have been incredible support from Banner, incredible support from all the teams. And Dr. Gopalan has been instrumental in helping put this together. So in 2019, we dedicated 2019 to put the program together with, from a regulatory standpoint, from a patient safety standpoint, and uh, training everyone at BUMCP to be able to do this. We got approval from the federal government in 2019 to start the program, and we performed the first heart transplant in February of 2020, right before the COVID pandemic started. And that what that did to us was actually that we had to modify how we did, we, how we have done the, the following nine transplants. So we have done a total of 10 transplants at this point. All the patients have done very well. The next important step for us is to be able to get approval from uh, the Center for Medicare Services in, or, or CMS. Once we get approval for, from them, we will be able to take this technology and this therapy even further out. So we're planning to be able to expand to doing heart kidney and heart liver in selected patients within the next year. Uh, but we need to have to be approved or certified by, by the federal government, by CMS. We have already started about two weeks ago, our outreach program and marketing the program outside. So that is an incredible amount of work in about 15 minutes. I hope I stay to my time. I just wanna thank everyone, all the guests for connecting with us, with Patrick Cian and the Banner Health Foundation. I wanna thank Dr. Gopalan for his incredible work and Dr. Goodman for his support. Trixie Ann's role in our team is to continue to reach out, share our work and engage with, with you on how we can provide your support and have the biggest impact in this program. Thank you for your time. Dr. Arbia, that is truly remarkable. And I know we all appreciate getting that whirlwind tour through the world of mechanical circulatory support and transplant. 
Before we go on to Dr. Gopalan, I'd like to ask you a question. You know, in your career, you've been part of the development of many of the technologies that you just showed us, and you built several very successful heart failure programs. Can I ask what brought you to BUMCP and to Banner Health? Well, it, it's a very simple and very complex. I can tell you uh, it was not the summer weather, uh, but I, you know, I realized because I had been here before that there was a need for this type of program here. And not only the need for the merger between Banner and University of Arizona provided an incredible ground to be able to develop this to a new level that has not been done anywhere in the, in the US at this time. And we can, as, as we continue to grow, we can be play a role model, not only in the state, but in the region, the country, and hopefully the world as we continue to provide this newer technology and be able to help our patients. Thanks, it's really remarkable. And we are very lucky to have you here and very fortunate to have our next speaker, who I have the privilege of introducing now. Dr. Radagopalan was appointed the Center Director for Advanced Heart Disease at Banner University Medical Center, Phoenix, in July of 2017. He's an associate professor at the University of Arizona College of Medicine and the director of our advanced heart failure, mechanical circulatory support, and heart transplant programs here at Banner University Medical Center, Phoenix. Dr. Gopalan received his medical degree from St. George's University School of Medicine and completed his internal medicine residency at Beth Israel Medical Center in New Jersey. He completed a cardiology fellowship at Robert Wood Johnson Medical in New Jersey as well, and has completed additional fellowships in cardiac electrophysiology and heart transplant at Hahnemann University Hospital in Philadelphia. His academic and research interest is centered in mechanical circulatory support devices, pulmonary hypertension, and chronic and acute heart failure, including cardiogenic shock and heart transplantation. In 2019, he was a finalist for Phoenix Business Journal's Healthcare Heroes Award with his colleague, Dr. Robin Blackstone. Dr. Gopalan notably received a Best Teacher Award at Hahnemann University Hospital and was named one of Philadelphia's top docs. He's also the author of Second Opinion, Eight Deadly Diseases, where he discusses both Western and Eastern approaches to treating disease. His second book will be published later this year. He's also a board certified medical acupuncturist and certified yoga teacher I had to pick one word to describe Radha. The word that I would choose is healer. A healer does many things and has many ways of healing, many ways of healing, and Radha embodies all of those. And so I'm so privileged to introduce him here to you today and to hear the story of a remarkable case and the incredible work that Radha and his team did to help this incredible young man back to health. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Goodman, for those kind introduction. Um, and uh, I want to thank uh, Dr. Arabia for a uh, awesome presentation of the program that uh, that Banner has helped us build to serve the community of the Greater Phoenix and beyond, uh, going beyond the state and internationally. And I also want to thank the audience for joining us today to hear about what uh, what great things are happening at Banner to serve the community that we love and, and be uh, to call uh, our uh, you know, co-habitants in, in Phoenix. Um, in the next slide, what, what, what I like to do here is to, in the piggyback on Dr. Arabia's information that was provided and take a journey of a young man through this process and illustrate how Banner is, has geared up and improved, uh, has uh, provided the resources to truly help a person in need and give a second chance to live and enjoy life fully. This particular patient is near and dear to my heart and most of my team members. You will also see the team, it's not it's not a work of one person. It is a work of several people. It actually takes a village to take a patient 
through this program that Dr. Arabia described. But more importantly, it also takes an institution that provides all the resources that is required in a short period of time where we can make decisions without delay so that the patient's life can be saved. A 28-year-old gentleman from Tennessee originally was drafted to go to Afghanistan to the battlefield. During that time, he develops heart failure and he was evacuated to back to Tennessee to get medical care for his heart failure where in the university program there, he was told that he had end-stage heart failure, meaning he doesn't have many years to live. He was told he had two to three years and the only option is heart transplant. But because his condition was so severe, he couldn't undergo heart transplant right away. So they recommended one of the devices that you just saw, a left ventricular access device that Dr. Arabia explained as a solution. So in the next slide, everybody in Tennessee was happy that they could help this gentleman, just like we would be at Banner University Hospital, providing the required treatment for a patient in need. However, this gentleman in the battlefield, having developed heart failure, developed what we call PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. As a result of that, after receiving the device and hearing that his lifespan is short and that he needs heart transplantation as a final treatment, his PTSD was exacerbated. And that required intensive treatment. He did well with the surgery, but unfortunately, unforeseen complications developed. One of those complications is abdominal hernia that resulted from the surgical procedure, which is a, a very common complication that is anticipated. And the second is obesity. He was obese to begin with, and that is one of the reasons the device was placed to prepare him for transplant. So with these three barriers, he lived with the device, hoping that he would become eligible for heart transplantation. Unfortunately, his obesity did not correct. Its PTSD was being treated, but not optimally treated. He lived with the fear of death every single day and have no hope of getting to the final treatment, which is heart transplant. And his abdominal hernia was cosmetically actually bothering him and he needed to live monitoring his symptoms every single day. So as you can see, 28 year old gentleman who went to the battlefield to fight for our country, comes back with a life threatening disease. He has been partially treated but does not see the light at the end of the tunnel to get to heart transplantation. So in the next slide, we will see all the barriers that he's battling away from his battlefield in the hospital with the health system. So the obesity, the hernia, the PTSD. So finally, he goes back for follow-up at the, at the university hospital that implanted the device and asks and options for heart transplant. At that time, he was told he is not a heart transplant candidate because of the obesity, PTSD, and the abdominal hernia. So he had no options in Tennessee. Fortunately, he had one of his sisters living in Phoenix. He relocates across the country to look for options and he comes and joins our program to be taken care of with regard to the device. We started looking at him for heart transplant. And finally, we thought that he should be offered heart transplant. He gets worked up in our program. Unfortunately, heart transplant offer is a process. It goes through several steps of evaluation, discussion, among a lot of experts like Dr. Arabia and other surgeons and coordinators that you will see the team 
in a few seconds. And a committee makes the decision as to whether the patient is a candidate for heart transplant or not. And the committee on the first go around declined the patient for the very reason that he was declined in the other program. He's being told for the second time, he's not a candidate for heart transplantation. One of the most devastating things happened to him at that point. He started getting cardiac arrest, sudden death. As you will see in the next slide, if I remember, I have been in his room practically every day when he was in the hospital, trying to shock him out of the cardiac arrest. In other words, his heart was trying to die. That means he would be dead. We looked at how, much, how many times he has been shot. He was shot in excess of 50 times to bring him back to life. He was also intubated and placed on mechanical ventilation to minimize the shocks. Interestingly, what triggered his shocks was his anxiety. The anxiety coupled with a bad heart triggered sudden death which is well known in the literature. So an additional barrier and a constant battle with no hope of transplant placed every single one of us, including the patient and his family in a very hopeless situation. At this time, our program reached out as we always do in healthcare for a second opinion. We reached out to another program in Phoenix and asked, could he be a transplant candidate at your center, which is a fair thing to do for a young man, a veteran who went to fight for our country. He was denied transplant at a third center. So if you look at the next slide, he went to a non-banner hospital in Phoenix and he was declined for heart transplant. So first he was declined at Nashville, Tennessee. He comes to us, we decline him. And then he goes back for a second opinion. He was declined. At this time, we are desperately struggling and exploring options to get given an option for this young gentleman. Because he was a veteran, we found out that VA has an agreement with the University of Utah to take care of veterans. We reached out to the University of Utah and asked if they would Take a look at him. After stabilizing him from the cardiac arrest with multiple medications, he and his mother left driving from Phoenix to go to Utah in search of an option to survive. On the way, he arrests. He gets sudden death, cardiac arrest, gets shocked by his defibrillator, and was then transported to the University of Utah. University of Utah evaluates him and considers him high risk for transplant. As a result, they declined him to accept him for heart transplant. He and his mother drove back to the only place they knew, Phoenix, where he was cared for very diligently. And I, rem I still remember, he came and said, Dr. Gopal, I have no options. I don't know what to do. Fortunately, Dr. Francisco Arabia had joined us and I called Dr. Arabia and I said, Francisco, this is a young man who went to fight for the country. We have to figure out a way of offering and extending his life. It is something that absolutely has to be done. There has to be a way we should figure that out. We both agreed on a plan to figure out with multiple other specialists to eliminate the barriers. So with regard to the obesity, we collaborated with our bariatric surgeons and he underwent bari uh, gastric bypass surgery and lost weight. With regard to the hernia, we collaborated with the general surgeons and got their opinion as to how risky it is to undergo heart transplant, whether the hernia should be repaired prior to heart transplant or after the transplant. 
we got the appropriate recommendations. And then he was treated appropriately for PTSD. We worked with our psychological colleagues and provided optimal treatment. And he, in fact, you will, I'm happy to report that he's off of all his medication for PTSD now. When we eliminated the barriers, we decided we will, he, his, his abdominal hernia will be repaired after the transport. That still placed him at high risk. So he's still considered high risk. But if you will look at the team that made an impossible, um, that will be the, an impossible, courageous decision to take this young gentleman through a life-saving surgery. This is our physicians and surgeons and ancillary care providers, intensivists, nurse practitioners, and directors who, who help us on a daily basis to maneuver the ship with regard to every patient. And in the next slide, the real machine that helps us do every small task that is required so that the program can bring together all the resources that is required for a life-saving surgery. And this team made a courageous decision to offer a life-saving transplant at Banner University. Based on that decision, he was approved in the second time go around discussion. And that was one of those happiest days for me, but more importantly, the patient really appreciated and his mother and his sister and the rest of the family in Phoenix. He underwent heart transplantation successfully through our program. His weight after the gastric bypass surgery dropped to slightly above ideal, very close to ideal weight. He started with the BMI of 39, that is called body mass index, which is one of the parameters we use to describe how obese a patient is or a person is. He dropped from 39 to 29. Anything between 18 to 25 is considered normal obese or normal weight, normal BMI. Based on those findings, and after undergoing heart transplant, he was discharged home to reunite with his family and live. In fact, I'm happy to report, he returned to Tennessee. But more importantly, where is he today in the next slide? He made a travel across the world to go to Japan and climb one of the mountains where he believed one of his ancestors were buried. He wanted to pay his respects. In fact, he's planning to relocate to Japan and live there. I am so proud to be associated with the team that you saw. I'm so proud to be at Banner University Medical Center offering this kind of rare, but state-of-the-art treatment to those that deserve and deserve to live just like this veteran who was ready to lay down his life to our country. We find solutions in the difficult situations, in the impossible situations as a team with collaboration between the institution and the providers. And more importantly, I'm really happy to be working with Dr. Francisco who has made this possible for us under his leadership and direction. We have been able to move so fast in being able to offer this without further delay in a cosmopolitan city, which is considered fifth largest city in the country, offering academic medicine to those who truly deserve. I want to thank Dr. Jeremy Goodman uh, for joining us in those kind words, Trixie Ann and Christy Adler for putting this together and our, our media technology team and Dr. Arabia for uh, describing our awesome program in detail. Thank you. Dr. Kapalan, thank you. It, it really, it sounds pretty miraculous uh, to those of us who don't do this every day uh, and at the risk of diminishing this one amazing story, I have to say these kinds of miracles have become pretty commonplace in the advanced heart failure program. 
Um, and I don't think it surprises people as much here anymore because we see this kind of commitment and amazement every day here from, from you, Dr. Araby and your team. Um, I wanna ask you, Dr. Gopalan, that's a particularly difficult and ultimately very successful case. And I know that each of your patients presents a unique set of challenges. I wonder, what would you share and what do you share with families in understanding how best to support their loved ones through their care, recovery, and into their new normal? Yeah, so we, we tend to emphasize four different points to them. The first and foremost is the process is a marathon and not a sprint. It might have sprints interspersed in the marathon, but it is a long-term commitment and a process where the second part joins into that and it's a team sport. There are two teams. One team that supports the patient. The patient needs caregivers, parents, families, brothers, sisters to support them at home. And there's another team that becomes their family, which is at Banner University Medical Center, the transplant team. So two teams together, coming together, equal partnership with commitment and with vested interest. And therefore teamwork is elaborated and given information on how to play the game as a uh, team to, to achieve the desired outcome. And the third one, we always try to educate in small, small uh, doses to the patient and the families is tolerance. Tolerance is very important. We live in a world where we want uh, instant gratification. We explain to them in medicine, things are very unpredictable, things change. So rapid changes in health requires rapid adjustment of lifestyle. So we request the families, please be mindful. It could, you need a lot of tolerance for unexpected events that can happen during this life-saving process. More importantly, these patients are placed on medications immediately after transplant that can actually make them behave somewhat uh, sort of very energetic fashion. For example, steroids are very commonly used after transplant and they become very energetic. And they might be irritable. They might be, um, they may not have tolerance with the family members. So we educate them and warn them, these are things that you would see, which is another Im third important part. But I think the final pinnacle of this is to informing the family and the patient. It is truly a gift. Someone has to die in order for someone else to live. And therefore it is a gift, a heart, that gives a second chance in life and we educate them why we do what we do, going through the multiple difficult hurdles to make decisions and finally offer this and make sure that the patient survives as long as they can. Our focus is making sure that the patient keeps at heart for the next 20, 30 years and enjoy and reap the benefits of a life that they have dreamt for. These are the four areas where we educate the family and the patient, uh, how they can be successful in supporting their loved ones. Well, thanks, Dr. Gopalan. We have about 10 minutes right now for questions. Um, I see one question in the, in the chat box, so I'll start there. And I'd like to encourage our guests to please go ahead and put any questions they have for our uh, distinguished speakers here in the chat box. and I will be happy to share them. Um, Dr. Gopalan, this question goes to you. Um, you are certainly a master in caring for patients with end-stage heart disease, but I, I know from our conversations that you also have a commitment to keeping people away from ever developing end-stage heart disease. And so here's the question. Uh, one of our guests wonders if it's helpful for patients to take things like fish oil or other supplements to support heart health. And perhaps you can talk a little bit about how we can all be healthier and our day-to-day -day lives so that as nice as you two gentlemen are, we can avoid ever having to be in your office. I like the question for a reason, the best way to win a war is to never fight one. So that's um, exactly what we as physicians always want to have patients not having to come back to us or come and see us. If we can keep them out of the hospital and out of seeing us, that'll be the best thing that can happen. Unfortunately, um, 
we live in a world where diseases, parasites, viruses, they all, we have no control over and things do happen, like what happened to this gentleman. So these things do happen. Health definitely helps. Uh, preventative measures, as that was mentioned in the, uh, in the question, definitely helps. And as long as a, an individual works with the appropriate health provider under their guidance and recommendations in, in taking supplements and things are helpful under the right directions. So I would always, always recommend a healthy living lifestyle is beats any disease management. Thanks, Dr. Gopalan. Uh, Dr. Arabia, this next question is for you. Uh, can you tell me if there is an age at which heart transplant is no longer an option? And if so, are there other options and specifically mechanical circulatory support options that might be available to those who don't qualify for a transplant? That's a great question. And it's very real because we get that asked that often. So I can tell you in, in the U.S., the majority of the transplant program have, have a cutoff age of about 70. Although, uh, as programs are, some programs are very aggressive, very large, and there is just one or two programs in the country that have gone up to age 78. Uh, but that is, is, is not common. Now, what happens someone in early 70s, mid 70s and beyond, even to the 80s, who needs support and is deemed that a heart transplant might not be the best option because it's not surviving the operation, it's surviving the time after the operation, after a transplant, with all the medications that can damage organs or put the patient at risk for infection. So the option there, yes, it is mechanical circulatory support, and left ventricular assist devices have been done in patients in the 80s with very good outcomes. Thanks, Dr. Arabia. I'm gonna stick with you for the next question. Can you talk a little bit about the impact of international collaboration in advancing the field of advanced heart failure? Yes, that is, is there is no doubt that what we believe and we practice here in the US is not necessarily the same uh, in Europe or in Asia. For example, in, in Europe, the, there are less human hearts available for transplantation. So mechanical circulatory support has a bigger role. Uh, it has even artificial hearts has even a bigger role in Europe because there, the number of transplants is less. Now, in, in Asia, transplantation is not an option. For example, Japan has a very small number of transplants and China has been, has been very controversial in, in their involvement in transplantation. So in some places in China, they're trying to move towards prevention, which is crucial, is the best medication is prevention. And actually they have designed some mechanical circulatory supports in, in Asia. So there is no doubt that it's different in different parts of the world. And because it is different, collaboration, then we learn how other people are doing things. And we can then bring some things to, to our practices. And I think Dr. Gopalan probably should comment too, because he brings a completely new, different perspective of prevention and better solutions, probably from a natural standpoint, that transplantation and, and mechanical security. So, Dr. Gopal, let's uh, turn it over to you and get your thoughts. Yes, and I think one of the examples of collaboration, uh, as Dr. Arabia mentioned, is um, you know different thinking process, different ways of behavior. And if you go from west to the middle to the east of the country, one of the collaboration that's happening at our center that Dr. Arabia mentioned is the French total artificial heart comet that is coming here, which is an example of a collaboration among leaders like Arabia and the leaders in Europe. Um, and that device has, uh, uh, has uh, been e already implanted in, in European countries. And we are testing it here because of its, uh, some of the superior abilities of that. That is one of the collaboration. On the other hand, 
one could collaborate and figure out about uh, being healthy in lifestyles that uh, adapted in some other countries. For example, Japan has been touted most of the time as a healthier country um, because of their lifestyle. And adapting some of the Eastern philosophies um, into our Western lifestyle uh, might help us in either, if not, if it may not prevent it, but it could delay it. And in some cases it can prevent it. So, and I think a, a combined approach um, in, in a lifestyle changes, healthy lifestyle, close monitoring, uh, guidance from a healthcare provider, and then collaboration among the medical providers with regard to advancing technologies and sharing of thought process of you know, different cultures and countries and medical systems will only augment the abil our ability to provide the best care for any individual in this country. Dr. Gopalan, uh, our next question uh, will be for both of you, and I want to give you each one minute to answer uh, as we're coming up on the 5.30 hour. Uh, so we'll start with you, Dr. Gopalan. Where do you think philanthropy can have the greatest impact on creating options and access for our heart failure patients and their families? Philanthropy has a tremendous impact on it, and I will try to stick to the one minute. If I am going to say this, if I benefited most of the time whatever has given us an opportunity to advance ourselves to the next level in life, giving back has always has a place because it has a spiritual connection. The spirit moves the other spirit. And that is my best explanation. When I give, it moves the other spirit. Paying forward is always helps. And so philanthropy has a tremendous, tremendous effect in us being able to overcome barriers, especially financial barriers, that happens every day in life um, with regard to medicine. And Dr. Arabia, I know you've, uh, you've worked at several medical centers that have a, a long and healthy tradition of philanthropy to support their flagship programs. So I wonder if you could share your thoughts on the role of philanthropy in advancing the heart failure program. Thank you. So they Philanthropy is crucial. And, you know, let's let think for a second. The, the biggest philanthropy in heart transplantation actually comes from the donor family that actually are, contribute the organ of the loved one. And that, for me, is, is the ultimate type of philanthropy, which makes heart transplantation a reality. But philanthropy is crucial not only in overcoming financial barriers. It can give opportunity to people who have minimal resources or the inability to be able to access these technologies, these therapies. It has the ability also to help in the development of new therapies, like some of the ones that I described. It has the ability to be able to bring a team and reach out, outreach to the ultimate level. So philanthropy is crucial and there is never a good way for us to pay philanthropy. We want to give because we have received how to do, learn how to do all these things. We can never give enough. So we need help from others to help us help others. Well, thank you. Gentlemen, this is, has really been an extraordinary hour and I'm so grateful to both of you for taking time uh, from your days to share the experience of the Advanced Heart Failure Center with us, with our guests. Um, I think it's pretty easy to see from the last hour why the Heart Institute is really Banner University Medical Center Phoenix's flagship program. It's so easy to get behind leaders like this. And we have a long and enduring commitment to cardiology, our Heart Institute, and our Advanced Heart Failure on our Banner University Medical Center. I wanna thank our guests and particularly our inspiring patients. We're honored by the trust you put in us and please know that we will never let that trust down. I invite you to continue to learn about the Advanced Heart Failure Center and the Heart Institute and how you can be involved as a supporter and champion for those patients and families who are impacted by heart failure. I would be remiss if I didn't take a moment to thank Trixie Ann, Dorothy, Christine, Christy, 
and all the members of the Banner Health Foundation for sponsoring and organizing today's conversation and for helping to organize our philanthropic efforts to make sure that we can continue to provide cutting edge patients, uh, cutting edge services and technology to patients from all walks of life. Trixie Ann will be keeping you informed on the work of the center as well as future at home together webinars. I wanna thank you all for joining us tonight. I wish you a healthy and safe good evening and look forward to seeing you again at another at home together webinar. Have a great evening everyone.